Joanne, for that introduction. And um, also thank you very much for the invitation to come and present today. When Joanne first spoke to me about coming and sharing work about music technology to address pain, I must say I felt a little bit at a loss because pain is not a specialty area of mine at all. And I, it, it wasn't a combination that I'd thought about before, technology and pain. However, one image did come to mind, an image that I often use when talking about music technology. And it was this image that really set me brainstorming with Joanne about how I might link these two areas. And it was this image. A woman who, after profound brain damage, was in a state where we didn't know how aware she was. We, uh, we were, her eyes were open and she was responsive to her environment. And we were trying to find a way of uh, enabling her to communicate yes. So we didn't bother about no yet. We were just trying to get yes. And the way you use the, you, you uh, approach this with people who have minimal movement, disordered movement, uh, no verbal communication, uh, altered states uh, that they're in an altered states of, uh, of consciousness is often using technology, using a simple switch. And what we see here is this lady um, actually trying to press down this switch which, when it's pressed, makes this awful noise I'm going to make for you. Really loud, high-pitched, horrible sound. And so this is how we train people to use the switches as a way of getting into yes, no. And I'm sure any of you working in rehabilitation might be familiar with this. So uh, this was the image that came to mind. And I thought, uh, we started talking about pain and I said, actually psychic pain, you know, the, the, the pain which we can't necessarily touch and we don't fully understand. And people such as this lady here can't communicate to us in any way, but we can only imagine what it must be like to live in this state of not being able to communicate, of people not knowing whether you are aware, people not knowing what you want. So this is the image that came to mind. In the presentation today, I'm just going to pass over a few definitions about technology and uh, psychic pain. And I'm going to give a little bit of background to technology in music therapy as it's used, the settings, the methods, and the populations. I'm going to focus a bit more on psychic pain. And then I'm going to offer some case illustrations, which I must stress are not from my own clinical work. I've drawn um, case illustrations from the work of therapists who, whom I've been researching or who ha are writing for uh, a book which is forth forthcoming next year on music technology in therapeutic and health settings. And lastly, I'll summarise. A lot of the work I'm going to be referring to comes from two main research projects. One of these took place in the UK, exploring the use of music technology in clinical music therapy, where my colleague Karen Berland and I looked at establishing definitions uh, and scope of practice. We were most interested in uh, how music therapists were using technology and when they used music technology, whatever that is, when they used music technology, were they doing anything different than they might have been if they'd been using acoustic instruments? And I think this has long been a, uh, a continuing burning question of mine in the absence of guidelines um, of, for, for practice. Following from this study, I was fortunate enough to uh, be awarded a Leverhulme Fellowship to expand the exploration over here in the US, which is when I was based in Boston at Berklee College of Music, um, with Dr. Suzanne Hanzer, who you've already, or actually Suzanne just spoke, just in the last session. Um, and this project was music technology in therapeutic and health settings, where I looked to try and define further um, what technologies are being used, uh, with, with which populations, how are they being used, when are they used, in which situations, and when are they not used? When are they contraindicated? And this study involved interviewing uh, many music therapists around the US, several of whom are here in this room. Okay, so I'm just going to offer a couple of definitions first of all about technology. And this is about technology more broadly. 
the development use and knowledge of tools, machines, techniques or methods of organisation in order to solve a problem or perform a specific function. So technology can also refer to the collection of such tools, machinery and procedures. You can see it's very broad and technology can be uh, uh, something as simple as, well this is maybe not so simple, but something like a, a mouse um, or something which is completely um, non-electronic um, but just mechanical. However, I'm going to be focusing on electronic music technologies and really this definition is still evolving. So for the purposes of this presentation, I'm talking about uh, a broad description uh, on gi uh, giving a, a broad description for a range of tools and devices which are able to generate musical sounds through electronic, digital or mechanical means. And particularly, I guess, focusing on the electronic and digital aspects. So I'm sure when you read uh, technology in the title, your response might have been one at either end of a spectrum of, uh, great, I love technology, I use it all the time, part of my everyday life, part of my everyday practice, to the other extreme of, I hate technology, I never use it, and it has no place in music therapy. Mm -hmm which is what some people think. It has no place in music therapy. So um, people have different, different responses to technology, but we can't deny that technology is more and more part of our, not just everyday practice, but within our every hour practice. And there are more and more gadgets being produced to lure and seduce those of us who are not particularly attracted to technology at all. We know that technology is used across the lifespan and indeed this is the case in music therapy as well, that music technology has been used in clinical settings uh, from neonates, uh, prematurely born neonates, through to with people who are older. Music, uh, music technology is used cross-culturally in music therapy. So I collected data from people who've been using it in Africa throughout um, throughout the states and with a wide range of cultural populations. We also know that technology can be used within group settings, in dyads, or actually individually but within a group environment. So similar to instruments, similar to acoustic instruments. And then of course we have um, a range of music technologies which can be which have been adapted for use for people who have differing abilities. And sometimes these adaptations are more complex uh, and sometimes they're indeed just very simple uh, additions. Technology is used in music therapy both for its visual potential um, but most dominantly for its, uh, predominantly for its uh, audio potential. And this is an image of somebody performing using a uh, sound beam, which is this, this is actually, uh, is anybody familiar with this in the room? Okay, great. So this is actually like a switch. It's a sensor and it emits uh, an invisible beam, which you can't see, but you can hear. It's a, 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 a click, a, a fast paced click. And it emits a beam uh, which spans out like this depending on how far uh, you set the range. So you can set the range as close as this or you can set the range many, many meter, uh, yards away. Um, and so here we have, and, and what happens is that it, when you break the beam or interrupt the beam, it generates musical sounds. And it was first of all created, I believe, for dancers actually, to, uh, because it's a, a great tool for movement, for picking up movement. And here we have somebody who's using it. Um, he's got two sensors on him, so he'd be creating two different sounds, and his movement is breaking the beam. So this is a, a piece of equipment which um, is very popular in the UK and I would argue very poorly used as well. And I also have very mixed feelings about the sound beam and believe it's just used inadequately. It takes quite a lot of skill, more skill than it looks like. Um, 
So just some more images. Here's another picture of, of sound beam being used, but also we've got here switches. I've got a particular love of switches um, because of my long work in disab neurodisability with people who have very complex movement problems. So for many of uh, the people with whom I've worked, a t they might have a tiny, tiny little movement. And so we set that person up to control their whole environment and communication using tiny movements. And this is an image of a device, a prototype um, device, which was developed and trialled with a person who was admitted as an inpatient at our hospital. It's a brain-computer music interface uh, using an EEG cap to pick up uh, brain waves and generate these into musical sounds. Uh, an article was published on this, on the development of this device and its trial with our, with our, um, our colleague, our collaborator, uh, a woman who was admitted to the hospital for locked-in syndrome, so she had only upward eye movements, but fully cognit cognitively aware. And we trialled this with her and indeed found that because she was so used to using eye gaze systems, that she was more able at using this, this device and this piece of technology than any of us, where we were really clumsy with our eye movements. And it, it uses a combination of eye movements to, uh, and uh, picking up brain waves to generate musical sounds. So there's more written about this. If you want to read about this, it's in a special issue of Music and Medicine. So what are the types of technologies that music therapists are using in their clinical work? Uh, a lot of this won't be, just out of curiosity, who does use music technology in their clinical work? Okay, only about 50%. Okay, so uh, you might be, I hope the rest of you are here because you're interested in maybe finding out a bit more. Is it relevant? Is it appropriate? Uh, the types of technologies being used in therapy, we've got self-contained music creating devices. And here we're talking about uh, electronic keyboards or electronic instruments, synthesizers, wind synthesizers, so a range of um, music creating devices which might uh, be digital or using electronic means. We have assistive devices which are switches and triggers and sensors um, which would be used either on their own, and I'll show you some video of that in a little bit, or in combination with software. We've got uh, computer software for composing, arranging and sequencing, music listening devices such as iPods. Um, we saw CD players earlier in uh, Fred's presentation. Or also digital handheld music devices, and by this I mean things such as uh, eye touches, where you've also got apps and iPads as well. Then we have recording technologies, not new to music therapy, but I think with the development of um, technologies, uh, we've, got a whole we've got a whole new range of possibilities in how we might be using recording as a therapeutic method. And then also music games such as um, Guitar Hero, Karaoke and Wii games. If you look at any of the literature um, about music therapy and its use in um, with different populations, uh, you would think that it seems to have a ro role primarily just with adolescents, children, and adults with neurological problems, because that seems to be largely the areas where people have written about it. Oh, and oh, I've said adolescents already. Um, and, uh, and indeed, some of those publications come from somebody else sitting in, in the room who really sort of pioneered the work in this area. Um, however, from the research I did with therapists working in the States, uh, what's, what is evident is that actually electronic music technologies are being used with people right across the, the, the lifespan, right from um, prematurely born neonates through to um, elders, and also in a range of medical, educational, home and community therapeutic settings. So as already mentioned, includes neonates in the, in, in the NICU, special educational settings, pediatric hospitals, acute hospitals, acute and chronic psychiatric in and outpatient settings, nursing homes, hospices and rehabilitation units. So really the question is, where is it not appropriate? I don't think I have the answer for that today, by the way. 
And one of my big questions as well in both the studies that I did was looking at are there different methods? When music therapists are using technology, are, there, are we doing something different? Is there something that hasn't yet been defined? And indeed it seems that music therapists are using technology in methods which have already been defined. Uh, songwriting, compositional methods, recording, improvisational methods, listening, receptive methods, recreative uh, activities and also multimedia project development because of the capacity to uh, use video um, video stimuli, vi video material and to develop sort of like a multimedia project. I'm just going to um, show you a, a little bit of video of technology in action. <coughs> I'm going to show you uh, a video of a young man called um, Lars, who, um, Lars Kinby, in fact, his mother uh, really wanted me to use his full name because she's so proud of what he's achieving. And so this is Lars actually in a music therapy session with his therapist, Michael Bertolami, who is based up in Watertown, just outside of Boston. And uh, you'll see Michael in the video. There is also an intern who's providing the music. And unfortunately, I didn't have permission to use his name. So he remains nameless. So th there's an intern as well. And I'm showing you this uh, video not because I'm suggesting that uh, Lars is in any particular sort of psychic pain, but because I wanted to give you an image of how it looks to use technology in, in music therapy, and particularly using the switch, which a lot of people aren't switched on to. Um, uh, and switches, it can, you know, they, they, people sort of think, well, they don't look very aesthetic and they look awful and they look childlike and, uh, you know, they might make this terrible high-pitched sound. And, but what you'll see here is that they're using, and this is a, a, a method commonly used by music therapists with people with um, uh, limited movement, with um, sensory problems, or indeed where they're working collaboratively with other members of the team to develop communication methods using switches, which is a very common in uh, speech pathology work. So you'll see in this example that the intern has recorded onto a switch called a Big Mac, um, a riff, a riff which is the basis of this jam. So uh, you've got the intern playing behind, you've got Lars playing the riff on the switch, and you've got Michael singing as well. All right, Rockstar. <laughs> Here we go, dude. These are all fired up. And play around with the angles, too, since we're doing that clapping motion, it might, might be good to kind of get it, you know, <laughs> that sideways angle. Sure. <laughs> all right, guys. Here we go. On the count of one and two and three. <laughs>
<laughs> that was nice, dude. Very nice, very nice. All right, let's um. Wendy, what's his diagnosis? Uh, do you know what? I I can't remember off the top of my head. So it wasn't visually impaired. Thank you. Yes, yes, and with uh, with learning difficulties as well. So, and I just realised during that actually it's Michael who's playing and singing the guitar. I've got this the wrong way around. It was the intern holding the switch, and Michael was instructing him to angle it so that uh, Lars could reach it. One nice thing about the Big Mac is that it's digital in some ways, but very analog in others. And so it's a nice kind of hybrid there. Mm -hmm. And when he would hit the switch, if his kind of spasticity caused him to hit it again while that riff was still playing, it didn't interrupt it. So that when he got excited and hit it again, if that kept starting over and over, that would have really inhibited the musical flow. Mm. They're, they're a fantastic device. They're such a simple, simple, inexpensive device, but very effective and can be used very musically, as we can see from that. Okay. So I'm going to... Um, focus now on some definitions about psychic pain. And in fact, I'm, I'm going to be covering both psychic and psychological pain. And although they're defined as slightly different things, I'm going to be using them interchangeably uh, for, the, for this presentation. So psychic pain has been defined as an unavoidable part of existence, deriving from unconscious layers of the personality and is rooted in early pre-verbal experiences on the border between the somatic and the psychic. And psychological pain, um, although there's, um, there's no clear agreed definitions of psychological pain, this is one which has been proposed, a lasting, unsustainable and unpleasant feeling resulting from negative appraisal of an inability or deficiency of the self. This negative self-appraisal is typically brought, typically brought on by loss of someone or something, or failure to achieve something that is intimately linked to core psychological needs. So whilst there uh, is no clear definition or agreement about a definition for psychological pain, there is agreement about the properties, the basic properties of uh, psychological pain. And these include negative emotions, including hurt, anguish, aching and soreness in the mind, being wounded, a loss of self, disconnection and a critical awareness of one's more negative attributes. An effective state of discomfort, anguish, distress, torment, heartache, pain and misery, and not being able to hold oneself together as a whole. Furthermore, characteristics um, of psychological pain include there being a cognitive discrepancy between the ideal self, as one would like to be, and the actual self. It's also agreed that psychological pain takes time to heal. So the implications for um, thinking about these characteristics are that we as therapists need to enable the person with whom we're working who is in psychic, psychological pain to experience positive self-images through actions which might challenge negative sense of the self, offer them or enable them to have feelings of achievement and experiences which have meaning. Resolving uh, psychological pain is seen to be essential so that the person can avoid negative consequences because pain can be destructive and leave someone irreparably damaged. So the outcomes, if positive, um, the person in psychological psychic pain can adapt and have personal growth and find an enhanced sense of meaning. But if, if we don't have a positive outcome, we have a negative outcome, then uh, it may lead to quite drastic um, results and certainly leave the person irreparably damaged. So the implications for therapeutic practitioners working with people in psychic pain are that our goals are really to help people experience these positive sense of self, achievement and experiences which have meaning. 
and also continued support so that patients may have the will to live fully and actually may have the will to live altogether. Now the relevance for music therapy, and it's interesting that uh, the word hope has come up uh, in earlier presentations today. The relevance for music therapy is that often we're working with people who, as a result of trauma, of illness, of um, disability, of life events, are experiencing immense loneliness and isolation, particularly for people such as the lady in the first slide I showed you who don't have means for communication. We may be working with people who have experienced disfigurement and thus have uh, changed self-concepts and struggle with actually redefining themselves. People who are experiencing enormous loss on many different levels. And lastly, people who may be facing hopelessness and having difficulty finding new meaning in life. Now I'm going to present some information, um, both case illustrations, but also just some uh, thoughts about ways that music therapists are using technology with uh, clients experiencing psychic pain, or, or how music technology, electronic music technologies, might be being used to address these specific problems. In particular, the case illustrations, which as I mentioned before, come from other therapists who either participated in the study where they were interviewed, or else they've, they've written um, chapters in the book which will be coming out next year. Um, the focus of the case illustrations is going to be about using technology to address issues of separation, issues of isolation, engendering hope in individuals, and also assisting individuals in gaining an alternative perspective of themselves, senses of achievement and self-concepts. So firstly, this is a very obvious way of using music, electronic music technology and something that it's not new to using music in medicine or music technology because people have been making uh, playlists. Uh, when I was growing up, it was making a cassette for somebody. You know, we all remember that. Those precious cassettes, do you remember? Yeah. Um, so, uh, so much easier nowadays with iTunes and all the different yeah. range of listening devices we've got, a myriad of listening devices. But how might these be used to address people who are experiencing psychic pain? Well, certainly using client-created playlists for pain management, so physical pain. Um, also, um, playlists created for the client to communicate messages of hope. So these may be playlists created by family and loved ones. It may be playlists created by the um, caring team, by the professional team. Uh, or indeed it may be, they may be actually playlists created for the client for themselves or by the client for, um, for others. So client and create a carer created playlists to communicate that which is too painful for words. Not a new idea in music therapy but something that, uh, a method that's been, that's prevalent in terms of using technologies. And then cry a client created playlists to loved ones who are absent. Again, addressing the idea of isolation and separation. Next, I'm going to focus on the idea of using music software. Um, and what came up repeatedly in the data that I collected was the use of GarageBand. Um, just out of interest, who uses GarageBand here? Mm, interesting. And within the clinical work specifically? Okay, so more if you use it for yourselves than for um, clinical work. That's interesting. But, uh, and whilst many people expressed using this as a, as a really useful tool, I've also heard it critiqued by, uh, by, by some therapists saying, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of quite a lazy way of, of using music software. But it does have some particular benefits. Um, for working with a whole range of populations. We've got this existing bank of loops, um, meaning that there's a, a big repertoire there from which we can draw, and draw very 
uh, we, we, we can draw from quite instantly. So it gives an immediacy to the work, which sometimes uh, one of my colleagues, Laurie Kubicek, working in Boston, who I'm going to refer to some of her work later, says really it's the first 30 seconds that counts. The client either throws you out mm. of the hospital, the, 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 the room in the acute hospital setting within 30 seconds. They make their decision mm. in 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. And so how you present something and the tools you've got to present are really, they've got to, they've got to really sell the idea to the client so that the client then can benefit from the tools that you're bringing. So the benefits of GarageBand are, besides this existing repertoire of loops, is that it also offers people the possibility of playing a range of instruments. And if you're working with people who, because of surgery, um, because of degenerative illness, uh, because of uh, chemotherapy, might be experiencing changed levels and ability, it can assist a client in moving from a position where they might have been able to play an instrument previously to one where they can now possibly play an instrument, the same instrument or a different instrument, but using GarageBand. And the examples that Laurie talks about are working with people who have had, um, uh, she, she, she works at Massachusetts, Massachusetts General Hospital working with adults um, who are receiving chemotherapy and radiation therapy. And she talks about um, when you're working with somebody who's maybe had surgery on the throat, the neck, the face or the mouth, mm -hmm. uh, singing might be impossible. The person may be experiencing immense fatigue or weakness or pain, which just makes playing instruments or uh, singing impossible. So. Engaging, uh, engaging, and engaging in, in new instruments, new acoustic instruments, may be too taxing, even when the person's fully cognitively aware. But also, if their if their cognition is uh, altered because of the medication, there's there's implications there for then trying to learn something new. So GarageBand actually gives this very immediate um, immediate tool with with multiple facets to it. GarageBand is also um, very useful as a recording device. And one of the benefits it offers is that you're able to uh, play a backing track, having developed a, a backing track using the, the repertoire of sounds. And then playing that in the background, actually then record the client as well singing over the top, speaking over the top, or making playing some other instrument over the top. So GarageBand is particularly useful both for its music generating properties but also for its recording properties. And lastly, it's useful with other multimedia uh, software for recording messages for the client. And uh, Laurie's given me examples which she's uh, written about for the, um, the book uh, next year about uh, working with clients who may have come in for treatment, been in the hospital for a period of time, built up quite a relationship with staff over a period of time, and then when um, treatment is no longer appropriate or indeed has been unsuccessful, maybe moving back home, and how the treatment team have actually used, developed multimedia projects as a team to send messages of love and hope for the person in the palliative stages of their illness. Uh, so literally videoing people, uh, making soundtracks, recording the team singing one of the patient's meaningful songs. So again, just thinking about these um, uses in terms of working with people who are isolated, dealing with hopelessness, and dealing with disfigurement. There's some practical issues here as well about what Garage, garage Band might offer. Now CD creation, as we know, it's not a new method because some of us were making cassettes back in the 70s. And, uh, but again, what is different here is the immediacy and using a combination of iTunes, uh, listening devices, recording devices, and then being able to press that CD. So within the space of five minutes, a client may have actually generated some music, recorded it, and be leaving with a recording of themselves of themselves with a meaningful other, or of themselves with the therapist, or of the therapist actually singing to them. So 
One of the important points here, and again thinking about using technology to address uh, issues of isolation and loneliness, are that client carer created CDs of spontaneous mu music making can be uh, instantly made and held onto either for the family leaving or for the individual staying in the hospital setting. Clients may create CDs for loved ones who are absent, bridging that gap of isolation. And CDs can be left as a legacy uh, in the face of the uh, client's passing. So CDs for the family or also for professional carers who may have built up uh, a, a relationship over a long period of time with somebody facing degenerative illness or, or uh, terminal illness. I'm going to present here a case study um, which has been published in one of the articles cited at the end of the presentation. Can I just ask, are people going to have access to the, they are going to have access to the handouts, aren't they? The PDFs of handouts. Did you send us your handouts? I did, yes. Uh, then yes, okay, That's great, okay. So just to say, this, this case illustration is from, again, an article from Music and Medicine, from the, the journal Music and Medicine, from the um, uh, special issue which came out on music technology in therapeutic and health settings. And it's a case study uh, developed by Annette whitehead Plo at Shriners Hospital in Boston. Working with children, um, Annette and her colleagues there work with a, a children with a, a number of conditions, but one of the issues in particular is dealing with burns injuries. So I'm going to actually read, read you the, the case study. Now, the case study talks about um, using technology with somebody, with a young girl, an eight-year-old girl who was isolated not just because she was in hospital and her family members were also hospitalised in other hospitals, but she'd come from another country, so she was isolated culturally as well. She was expressing feelings of helplessness, anxiety, loss of control, and needed a positive experience, needed a sense of success and needed achievement. So Marta was eight years old and was injured in a house fire with her sister Maria and her mother Frida. They were all flown to Boston to have from Honduras to have burn care, having sustained second and third degree burns. Marta's injury was least severe, but her sister and her mother were both intubated and sedated, and her mother was in a, a separate hospital. Marta expressed her feelings of helplessness and grave concerns about both her mother and her sister during the initial music therapy session. Annette suggested creating personalised CDs for her mother and her sister with their favourite songs, with messages from Marta recorded over the top, and Marta eagerly agreed to this. Using iTunes, Annette um, helped Marta choose specific songs for, each, for both of each of the family members. Using GarageBand, Marta recorded her self-speaking personalised messages for her sister and her mother. These message, messages were interspersed throughout the playlists so that each recipient could hear Marta's voice throughout the CD. And next, Marta wrote, with the assistance of Annette, a song for her mother. Using samples from Garage, garage Band, including Latin lounge piano, funky Latin drums, conga groove, and cartoon chipmunk, Marta wrote a short tune she titled Barbie Bella, Dancing Barbie. She smiled and said she felt proud of the song. Finally, the music therapist, or Annette, delivered the individualised CDs to Frida, and to Frida the mother and to Maria the sister, and gave a copy as well to Marta. So for Marta, being a child who was alone in a foreign country, her goals were to connect to her loved ones, to be empowered, to gain control, and to experience being successful. This simple use of technology addressed each of these goals. First, creating the CDs facilitated her connection to her injured family relative, uh, injured family me members, whom she was unable to visit, isolated and lonely. Second, Marta was able to help her family members by reassuring them with messages such as, the nurses are nice here, or mama, I'm doing good. Third, the intervention helped Marta experience feelings of control through her creative direction 
within the work. And finally, these interventions allowed her a sense of mastery. The CDs gave her a tangible experience of success. They gave her an immediate product and they were aesthetically pleasing. She would not have had the same outcomes with acoustic instruments because she didn't have previous music training and her tolerance for frustration was severely limited um, by her emotional state and the pain that she was in. So technology helped her meet her desperate desires to help her mother and her sister as they struggled for their lives in the face of hopelessness. Later in her music therapy treatment, therapists did use acoustic instruments. I'm going to move on to thinking about recording. Um, and recording is not new for music therapists, but recording as a specific method. And indeed, from the therapists who are writing about the way they're using recording as a method, it seems that it's widely used um, across a range of settings. And there seems to be a, either using garage band or professional studio equipment. And there seems to be something um, very important in recording about capturing personal sounds or a permanent record of loved ones. And um, I'm just going to refer briefly here to the work of Andrea Savasco, who's writing a, a, a chapter for the book. And she talks about uh, working with mothers in the NICU, mothers who have had premature babies, they haven't had time to name the baby, to do up the uh, nursery, they're in, uh, in a state of shock, uh, of anxiety, separated from the baby, and um, certainly feeling a loss of control. And Andrew describes the way that she uses uh, recording devices to capture mothers singing lullabies to the babies, which then the mothers can actually take home and listen to themselves. Andrea uses as a, um, a method uh, five days a week, twice a day, to take the, the CD in and play the CD to the, the infant of the mother's um, voice singing lullabies. And in this way, it actually helps with issues around isolation between mother and baby and presumably assisting with bonding. So the outcomes of this work are that recording sung lullabies can address the parent separation anxiety. It certainly enhances the parents' feelings of control, reduces their sense of helplessness, and addresses the baby's isolation and developmental needs as well. Lastly, in the case of the baby not surviving, it also provides a legacy of the baby's sounds. In the work with therapists talking about using recording, there is an, a phenomenon which seems to be emerging, which is that recording methods seem to allow clients to hear themselves back. And there's something about this in particular that assists people with gaining an alternative perspective of themselves and, and addressing uh, identity issues. So, Recording is quite a different experience from actively making music, or listening back is quite a, a, a different experience from actively making music, because it allows individuals to reflect, to recontextualize, and to reframe a perspective. I'm gonna draw from a case illustration here where we're gonna hear the words of somebody who uh, was a client in music therapy using technology. I'm not going to give specifics around this person's case because of confidentiality, but he was somebody who sustained a horrific, violent attack, which left him uh, permanently disabled so that he will be dependent for the rest of his life, disfigured, feeling fearful, in a state of dis despair, changed his identity completely, and really left him uh, throughout the earlier period of his rehabilitation and indeed during his nursing period with a complete loss of hope. So I'm going to actually read this out and try and uh, give you a sense of his experience. I laid in the hospital bed. I had this whole complete vivid memory of the night as if it was last night. And I laid there and it was like the trauma of the terror of the event and everything. And I remember laying there and I was just like, how am I gonna live out the rest of my life like this? 
And the thought was, it wasn't of suicide, it wasn't of, you know, dying, but it was maybe, it would have been better if I had not survived. And the thought was like, how am I going to live? I was in the nursing home and really didn't have anything. No future, not a point to where I was going. I felt dumped off. Your therapy is over. And it was very sad. It was a sad feeling and all I could think of was, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. Everything is getting darker. When I was in acute care, it seemed it was a warmer, cosier sort of place, more active. It was more, you know, I was working towards something. So the feeling was just to get moving, to get doing, going somewhere, home or somewhere. And we recorded it. And when we played it back, it was, I felt like, you know, there's life here. You know, there's something inside. And it really created some optimism about the future. But at that point in my life, during when I was in the nursing home, it was sort of like a different me. All of that stuff seemed to have been lost. It's just amazing how an event or trauma or something can separate you from what you always thought was, you know, reality or your world, I suppose. So I was removed from my reality and my purpose in life and stuff. And the music kind of brought it back, the songwriting. And it wasn't necessarily that I was a songwriter that brought it out. It was just the expression, you know, attached to a tune and melody and things like that. Sort of brought it alive, you know. And then we made it more alive, like more, I can say, like optimistic of the future. And at that point in my life, you know, I was someone who was questioning my own ability to function in the world. So therefore, I felt like I wasn't functioning. And then when I later heard it back, it was like, you know, it's something about hearing it in the song that sort of gave it, gave it colour gave it animation, you know, and then it became more of a reality, like, you know, moving on. It's not just a song, it's like my only hope, you know. So now I'm in touch with my hope. I don't think it's about the sound of the voice, I think it's more about what's going on. So it's whatever's going on inside. The way it was so instrumental for me was that I got to see what was going on inside. It was a lot of optimism. It wasn't like I was rejecting pe pessimism, it was just optimism. It was there. And it came out in these songs. And I realised that's what drove me on, because you've got to picture me as a broken, beaten down, done-in person who was taken out of their life, taken out of their hometown, taken out of the place where they grew up, attached to this horror story. I mean, who wants to be alive attached to some horror story? No one wants that. It changes the identity. It changes everything that you think about your life. Because now my life is this horror movie. So to get really what was going on in my music, you have to get the place where I was at, you know, which probably didn't show a lot in me because of my optimism. So here we have somebody expressing absolute despair and loss of hope. But the fact that when he listened back to his music, he had a chance to hear himself differently and also to engage in multiple listenings and to gain a different perspective of himself, to hear what was going on inside. And this seems to be something, the, the essence of what might be going on for clients when they record and then hear themselves back. So I do think there's something very particular about this method in terms of addressing issues of psychological pain, psychic pain, and particularly addressing hope. So just to finish up, what can technology offer those experiencing psychic pain? It can help reduce isolation from loved ones. <coughs> it can assist the, op the, the individual in gaining an alternative perspective of themselves, of doing biographical work, looking at where they've come from and where they might be going to, making comparisons of how I was how I sound, what's going on inside and where am I going to, giving somebody optimism and hope, and particularly the chance to re-experience oneself and gain alternative perspectives. I've drawn from a number of um, publications here, including forthcoming publications of the book, um, but if you would like any of this information, I'm very happy to email people with specific publications. Thank you. We have time at the
people have questions, and I see one right there. So are there any documentation about using this for people who are medicated by the or dealing with psychological issues mm -hmm. of self -centered? Mm -hmm. Well, at the moment, there's very little published, really, about this area. This area is quite a... Although music therapists are widely using technology, very few people have actually written about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I do believe there was a recent publication in one of the music therapy journals, and I can't remember which population that was with now. Can anybody help me out? It was last year, I think. Uh, no, okay. So, um, in, in the book that I'm publishing, there's a, a, a therapist working here, actually, in New York, in Brooklyn, who talks about working in a mental health unit in Brooklyn where you've got this multicultural, very diverse um, client group and it's on a forensic um, mental health unit. So you've got people who are dealing with all sorts of traumas as well of things that they've done uh, whilst being ill. And he talks particularly about using recording methods. So uh, using GarageBand for composition, but particularly using, uh, and using GarageBand actually as a tool for um, uh, recording a, a riff which can then be wrapped over. So it's, it seems to be particularly useful in uh, music therapy where rap is the, is the idiom being used, but also recording and listening back. And, this, and also a, another colleague has written about um, using Again, GarageBand and recording with adults in a day centre for people who've had head injuries. And often there's uh, comorbidity, often there's mental health problems or substance abuse on top of head injury, something quite typical we see. And he also talks a lot about uh, recording and listening back and the importance of this and the use of GarageBand. He talks about the use of GarageBand actually as a useful tool for people with differing cognitive abilities and, and using it more in a, in a, a framework uh, where you're trying to rehabilitate cognitive skills because it's involving um, decision making, uh, sequencing, planning, uh, reasoning. So it does seem to have, you know, again, it seems that technology can, can have uh, address all these issues much as we use acoustic instruments. Machinists or engineers or programmers, when you do some of this custom building, tell us a little bit about yeah. the team that you work with and how you manage to get these things done. Yeah, there's a lot of exciting work going on in this area, so uh, uh, internationally, I would say. In the clinical setting where I worked, we uh, had a fantastic group of biomedical um, rehabilitation engineers who could design anything. So their specialty was looking at the human body and being able to figure out the mechanics of anything that was needed. So they built amazing wheelchairs for people with very disordered um, uh, postures. And um, one of the issues was about building switches, so they would build us switches. And this is, I mean, I'm going back now 21 years, so before you could buy so many ready-made switches off the shelf, but they could really manufacture any sort of switch or sensor that we needed, depending on a person's um, sensory needs, cognitive needs, uh, motor needs. So um, what we're talking about here is skills looking at design and manufacturing as well as uh, identifying the clinical need which also might involve understanding the musical output. And this is a typical sort of model which is used in work where music technology is being used in disability, particularly complex disability we're talking about here. There's an exciting project going on at Berkeley College of Music with um, Dr. Richard Boulanger, who's head of electronic sound and production there. He has a group of students who are going out into the clinical workplace, uh, working with therapists and students in school settings who have complex needs. So the designers, the therapists identify the clinical problems the designers then design something, a music technology to be used. A lot of these are prototypes. They design the technology and then the client uses it and gives feedback. So you've got a tripartite model, if you like. 
And this seems to be a model and the, the, the catchphrase for this, sadly, it's not my catchphrase, it's Dr. Richard Boulanger's, is every therapist needs a geek, which was uh, his strap line. And, uh, and that's sort of a, a theme really without the, uh, within the, the, the work looking at this. And there's other, there's other communities looking at this as well, pairing music therapists with designers or with people who, um, well, actually the picture of the EEG cap is one, the brain computer music interface is one example of that. That was where designers designed something and they came to a clinical setting to trial it with somebody, with the music therapists um, advising as well. I think what's important is that uh, designers have these great ideas and they always want to design things and think this is great for disability but actually the, 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 the problem, the clinical problem needs to be looked at first. That's the sort of starting point where the client is. What is the difficulty they are having with the environment and then looking at solving it from there rather than designing a great gadget and saying we, will we can use this in the clinical well, setting. I know from working in Mass General, when you go to bioengineering, you have to go with a work order. With a work order. So mm -hmm. s somehow it has to get paid. The gadget's got to get paid for. So what, what was the mechanism in your hospital, and mm -hmm. how does that work at Berkeley? And okay. how is it actually happening if any, anyone wanted to do that? Okay. I'm a little out of my depth here because I've come uh, from another culture and a completely different health system where mm -hmm. yeah. things were funded. I got a grant to pay for those grants. Yeah, so you a specific have some soft money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think uh, finding, finding collaborations, particularly with universities at the current time, is the way to go. So that it, it ends up being sort of like a student student uh, generated project. Also Berkeley actually have got grants as well to pursue the project. Was there another question? Oh, yes. Yeah. You, you mentioned um, you said that the sound theme was being misused and I was wondering could you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, um, sound beam is this tool. It's very, very sensitive. So um, the great thing about that is that it's um, very responsive. So somebody with tiny, 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 tiny movements looking at my thumb, tiny movements can make a great big sound. They can, you know, that can be a massive sort of, massive sound uh, and great quality sound. The problem is that it takes quite a lot of skill to position the beam accurately. And the beam, the trajectory of the beam doesn't curve. The trajectory of the beam goes like this, it's straight. And human movement isn't typically straight. The trajectory is like this. And again, we're not working with ordered normal movement, we're working with disordered movements, we're working with people who maybe can't move in a straight line even if they wanted to, you know, we're working with whatever movement they do have. So one issue is that it's very sensitive um, and often uh, there's problems with the, with the trajectory of the beam, so you can set it up, and the client really gets their movement going and you might be practicing you know, you know, can you just show me your movement a few times, I'm going to set this up. By the time they've practiced it a few times, they're exhausted. Fatigue has set in and they can't move anymore. So that there's problems with um, the difficulty in setting up, the amount of skill required in setting up. And also my belief is that it's being misused because um, often it's just focused on people, on their movement. So somebody has movement and they're just making a barrage of sound. It's just a huge sound. And one of the important things with sound beam is that the person needs to be able to move into the beam, but they must be able to move out of the beam so that there's the possibility for silence. Mm -hmm. Expressing, got to be expressing themselves through um, a machine that talks. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering if you know about these and what is, is your opinion on them? Well, really, that's more into the realm of speech pathology, and also autism is not an area of mine. I would actually pass that over. If, if you're interested specifically in, in autism, I'd rather sort of, I don't know whether you feel able to comment yeah, on that. Yeah, because one of my chapters for your book, you know, features on that. Autism, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and there are a number of programs which take the idea of the PET symbol, the picture exchange communication system, and uses especially the iPad 
like an iPhone as a way to control those. So you can either get um, preset ones or a couple of the companies have subscription services. So for a certain amount per year, you can personalize your own and have all of the pictures loaded on with the various you know, words and phrases unique to that child and unique to his or her environment. So it's kind of like taking the old, you know, tap to talk um, and really making it a lot more personal and a lot more portable and more transparent. And I think the publication of your data is timely because we're now working with a new generation of clients who have always had the internet uh, kids who have always had smartphones, mm -hmm. soon it will be kids that have all, always had iPhones, access to iPads, third generation iPads coming out next month. Mm -hmm. So it's become much more, you know, transparent. I think we've all seen those, you know, things on the news of, of, of instant infants and young children trying to swipe magazine pages and wondering why it, it doesn't, you know, resize and move around like that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I love the iPad because it is transparent. We took iPads to Jamaica last summer and worked with um, infirm elderly um, people in very rural parishes. Uh -huh. Didn't even have electricity, you know, let alone technology. And because, especially for those who um, had severe diabetes and other, you know, physical needs, really had very little motion. But using an app on the iPad, Percussions Plus, we could bring up a range of those. Um, Latin American Afro-Cuban instruments that would have been used in, in the music that they listened to. And they were able to control that even just by rubbing, mm -hmm. you know, their stump of what was left of their mm -hmm. arm after, you know, amputation to play, you know, an Apuche Cabasa or something like that mm -hmm. while their favorite Bob Marley tune was playing off of iTunes in the mm -hmm. background. And the joy and the look, and this happened like this. Mm -hmm. There was no kind of delay and it was not an impediment. We see technology still as something yeah. between us and the client. I think as clients age now, they will not see that the other way because the technology for them will have always been in their world. And this is an example of you know using uh, GarageBand as an instrument where it gives you a good quality sound and an immediacy to playing an instrument when physical abilities no longer allow that. We use iPads. Do we have time for question. one more here? Really quick. I just wanted to kind of tail off of that the patients coming to us such knowledge. I recently had like a teenage patient who was given one or two word answers. I walked in and shared that I was a music therapist. First time meeting and I found, oh, I wrote this song after I got this new diagnosis. Let me share it with you. Much more skilled than I had with garage band, but played this already created before I even worked with him, which then led to a great discussion and I suddenly got a view into his world and what it felt like to be diagnosed. And it was he had much more knowledge than I did of that technology, but mm. shared that. And yeah. just to comment on that, what, what's coming up is that actually often um, therapists may be less skilled than the clients. Mm -hmm. So uh, the therapists go in, and what a great position. The therapist is disempowered. And the therapist can say, oh, wow, well, I don't know this too well. And I'm not talking about older therapists here. I'm talking about, um, you know, therapists who uh, are younger and very up to speed with, with technology, but don't necessarily know as much as the client. And the client can teach the therapist something. There's some great examples of that. Thanks, Wendy. Thank you.